And I can get some thumbs up. Can everyone see my screen? The Creative Catalyst? Yep. Awesome. I'll dive in here. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Seltzer, and I'm a market research and strategy consultant who lives out here in Las Vegas. I own a company called S2 Research. Uh, I'm the market research partner for marketers. Quick background on me. I started uh, at an ad agency here in Vegas about 15 years ago doing market research. Fell completely in love with it. Decided I'm going to do this forever. Um, have worked at a bunch of different ad agencies uh, since then, a few in-house teams. I was also the senior research analyst for four years at the Visitors Authority out here. And in 2019, I decided to start my own consultancy doing market research for those same ad, ad agencies that I love working with. Um, so that was the birth of S2 Research. Uh, what do I do? I do, literally, I do market research, which is the gamut, but that's everything from audience surveys to customer focus groups to inspiring creativity through better research. And that really is the focus of what we're talking about today. So again, today's topic uh, for the luncheon is the creative catalyst. And what we're talking about is creativity in marketing and specifically how you can become more creative or create even more creative marketing by asking questions. So before we dive any further into what I mean by questions, I always like to make sure everyone's on the same page um, about what I'm talking about when I talk about marketing. You know, there's a lot of different definitions for marketing. But the one I'm actually going to use, um, we're going to zoom in on this book here. I'm going to tell you guys a story called The Fictitious Epic of Market Clues. Now, I want to stress this is totally fiction. This is not how marketing came about, but it is a great metaphor. In fact, it's one of the, my favorite metaphors that I like to tell people about what marketing is from my standpoint, because it, uh, to me, it really kind of keeps everyone on the same page and ties everything that we're going to be talking about together. So let's dive into The Fictitious Epic of Market Clues, and I'm going to introduce you to two characters. On the left, we have Buyer Personius. And on the right is Cellaris. These are the two, two of the main characters in our story. So Buyer Personius, he has money, he has means, he wants to go out and buy stuff. And Cellaris on the right, fortunately, he owns a company called Cellaris Stuff. It's a very original name. He has stuff to sell. Now, this seems pretty obvious what's going to happen. Buyer Personius, he's going to give Cellaris money. Cellaris is going to give Buyer Personius stuff. They're going to exchange goods and services. And when that happens, when a, uh, two individuals exchange goods and services for goods and services, we call that a market. In classical economics, that is a market. A buyer and a seller have come together to exchange goods and services. So again, going through our, our story here, we've got buyer personas on the left, which means there's tons of buyers out there. we got sellers on the right. And this should be pretty simple. They're just going to exchange money for goods and go back and forth, and it's easy. Except it's not easy because there's a lot of noise in between these guys. Now, I have this illustrated right here as a city because there is a giant city in between our buyers and our sellers, and they're not always able to find each other. But noise is even more than that. Noise is all the different people and all the different businesses talking to buyer personas about how good their products are, how good their services are. Then there's also the businesses who aren't talking. There's people talking. And there's so much going on in this marketplace that wires are getting crossed, and no one's making connections. Not only is Cellaris down here not making any money, but this guy, buyer personas, he wants to buy stuff and he can't. He cannot find what he needs because there's too much noise. Enter our hero, Market Cleese, connector of creeks. So Market Cleese, the star of our story, he sees this happen. He sees that there's buyers and there's sellers and they're just not able to find each other and find the right buyers and the right sellers. And what he does is he starts bringing them together. He's handholding people and taking them to sellers and explaining to them that this is the person that they need. And every single time he brings a buyer and a seller together, he's creating a market. So he's literally marketing. This is the essence of marketing, is creating market, creating markets, bringing together buyers and sellers. Now, this evolved from just handholding to a lot of different strategies. Um, he, by, uh, market please here, he talked to the newspaper, for instance, and he got them to write up stories about how awesome Cellaris is and how awesome his business is. Um, speaking of stories and people talking, uh, Mark Cleese goes and talks to everyone he can about Cellaris uh, to tell him how good his stuff is, why they should be buying from them, because he wants his client, he wants Cellaris involved in every conversation about buying stuff. He prints up maps and advertisements to make it easier for people to find buy, uh, buyer or to find Cellaris and to find the stuff that they need. And he also works with Cellaris to create pricing and promotions and discounts. So around the times when people need to buy more stuff at once, they're thinking about the place with the best price, the best bundle all at once, and all of that ties back to sellers. And what Market Cleese finds is that the more he does this targeted marketing, the more times buyers go to sellers, the more times he ends up creating those markets. 
So again, this is a, a, a metaphor of a story, but what am I talking about when I talk about marketing? What I'm talking about is literally creating markets, bringing together buyers and sellers. So that's the definition of marketing that I want to use, but what I always kind of go off of whenever we're talking about this, but why do I tell the story of market foods? Why is that how I wanted to open today? Well, there's two reasons. First off, it's because this is what we do. If you're on this call, there's a really good chance you work in marketing in some capacity. And there's a concept in organizational psychology, which I'm a geek over, that's a whole nother section we can talk about, um, called empowerment, where the, the idea is that everyone is better at their job, better at what they do, if they realize that how they're involved in a project is part of a bigger story, in this case, bringing our buyers and our sellers together. You know, maybe you're the person who sells billboards, or maybe the person who comes up with the creative ads that go on the billboards. Maybe you pitch the TV news media, or you set up the digital ad campaign, or maybe you even just come up with the pricing and promotion to get people in the door at the very end. Maybe you're even the person, if you're on this call, who manages the entire process. However you're involved in marketing, in some way, shape, or form, you're involved in this story that brings buyer personas and sellers together, that creates markets. So again, this is, we're all involved in this. This is what we do. And this story is a really great way to, to explain that. But the other reason that I tell this story is in fact because marketers are storytellers. Now you've probably heard this concept before, um, but it's one of the, the, the most inherent things I believe of what marketers truly do for the sake of bringing buyers and sellers together. You know, there's a lot of different ways that I could bring a buyer and a seller together. Maybe, maybe it's a strategic camp, uh, PR campaign or a digital advertising campaign. Maybe it's uh, a combination of different tactics and mediums. However we choose to bring a buyer and a seller together, that's a story that we're trying to tell. And it's marketers who are the ones actually holding the pens and picking the direction that we're going to take our customers. So again, this is the clear-cut definition that I want to use for marketing that I always kind of explain about. But today's topic isn't just about marketing. It's about taking marketing, asking questions, and producing better marketing. So to dive even further into that, what do I mean by better marketing? There's two ways to look at better marketing, and I'm going to hit on both of them. The first is strategic. Um, strategic marketing is better marketing. It's where you do pieces of marketing, you do tactics and messaging in place for very specific reasons. Um, creative is the other side of better marketing. There's a propensity in our industry that the better ideas, the more creative, the clever ideas attract the most customers. And that's a theme that we'll see throughout. Actually, I've got a few more stories to share with you um, that aren't fiction. Uh, but kind of diving just a little further into that, what do I mean by strategic? Just really explaining it. So when I say strategic, I'm talking about all the different marketing mediums out there and how we're using them in the right harmony. You know, maybe it's the right combination of digital or PR or television, or maybe it's using all of those things in just a specific order and combination. However you use those tools, take an audience member down a path from interest all the way to becoming a buyer, that is a strategy. And it's more strategic than throwing spaghetti at the wall, which is a term I've heard used a lot, of just trying things out and seeing what works. It's a very methodical approach. But on the creative side, creative is something that we inherently appreciate as marketers because again, as humans, in fact, we like creative, clever, original ideas. On the right here, I've got Wendy. Now, if you guys don't know Wendy, you've probably purchased a burger, burger from her before. That's Wendy's Wendy. Um, at the end of 2019, Wendy's uh, published a Dungeons and Dragons campaign about Wendy. Now, for those who don't know, Dungeons and Dragons is a board game. It's played with books and dice and graph paper, and players sit around the table for several hours playing a game. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, there's only so many burgers that you can sell to a person in a week. And I'll tell you, I, I love burgers. I'll try to eat them every day. I'm still not going to be able to eat one every day. And if I can, it won't always be Wendy's. Wendy's knows this. They're not going to sell me a burger every single day, and it's not their job to sell me a burger every day. What it is their job to do is to make sure that when I do want a burger, Wendy's is at the top of my mind. And one of the greatest ways you can do that in the world of creativity is Wendy's found a way for me to sit down and play a three-hour board game with their mascot. You better believe I do that or the thousands of people who have downloaded that have done that. They're thinking about Wendy's when burger time does come around again. So again, there's some propensity in our industry for the love of creativity, especially when strategic. So diving back up here, we're going to ask marketing questions and get better marketing, and we're going to do that by telling better stories. So I, I know I have a few uh, former journalists on this call. You guys probably know this concept already, but again, we're telling good stories, and what questions need to be answered to tell a good story? So this, you probably remember this back from school, um, but every great story, to tell a really, truly complete story, 
you need to be able to answer who, what, when, where, why, and how. Now, this may seem elementary, it may seem obvious, but let's really think about this from a marketing standpoint. You're putting an ad campaign together or a marketing campaign or a digital campaign, and you want to say, who is your audience or audiences? Do you have multiple audiences that you're trying to speak to? Why? Why do they buy from you? And likewise, why are they buying from your competitors? Because the reasons you, that they do are part of your marketing story. What matters to these individuals? Is it price? Is it experience? What are they looking for when they're coming to you for a service? Where are they when they're thinking about you and the problem that your business or marketing inherently solves? And remember, every single business is inherently a solution to someone's problem. Um, how do they hear about you and when are they ready to buy? Because those two, those two points in time are very different from a mindset standpoint. So once you're able to dive in and answer every single one of these questions about your marketing before you put your strategy together, your strategy is gonna be that much more functional and effective because it's based on real information about your audience. But the other side of the coin with asking questions is the, the ability to be curious. And to do that, I wanna focus on this question, what here? Specifically, what would happen if? You know, there's a lot of great marketing that's happened in the history of the world that's focused on this question of what would happen if. And I'm gonna tell you a story of one of them. And to do that, we're gonna jump into DeLorean here and, and cruise on back to, of course, that timing didn't work out too well. There we go. We're gonna cruise on back into DeLorean to 1975. Tell a story about what would happen if. Um, so 1975, disco was ruling the world. And speaking of the world, Coca-Cola was also out there and they said they wanted to buy the world of Coke which at that time was one of their most successful ad campaigns in history. You know, speaking of Coke, 1975, Coke was doing pretty well. If 10 bottles of soda were sold anywhere on the planet in 1975, four of them were Cokes. That's compared to just one Pepsi. So obviously you can see here, Coke's the dominant leader. People like Pepsi, or people like Coke, they're drinking Coke more. Um, there's a huge noticeable difference. So the obvious thing that we could take away from this is that people like Coca-Cola more, right? Now, I'm not going to let you answer that. I'm not even going to tell you which one I drink because uh, it would dilute the conversation. But Pepsi was brave enough at this point to ask the question, what would happen if, specifically, what would happen if everyone thought that they actually liked Pepsi? Now, that seems like a weird question. Obviously, we're seeing that people like Coke more. So obviously, that's the preferred product. But is there a way that Pepsi could ask people that or tell them that they had the better product? Well, in 1975, Pepsi did exactly that they created a series of tests called the Pepsi Challenge. In this, they poured two small glasses of unlabeled soda um, into a Dixie cup, a small bits Dixie cup, and they asked everyone to try both sodas. Then they would ask them to pick their favorite. And in the vast majority of cases, people liked Pepsi, which totally blew everyone's mind. These are real Coke drinkers even, who prefer Coke, who say they prefer Coke. And here in a blind taste test, they found out they liked Pepsi. One of the reasons that we found out about this is Pepsi has a sweeter flavor than Coke overall. It has a different viscosity. And what we, we saw from this data or what the data is really saying is that taste preferences around 1975 were changing for these more sweeter flavors than what Coca-Cola was providing. And this was absolutely terrifying to Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola did exactly what anyone would imagine they would do. They went back to formula. And they spent 10 years toying around with different uh, sugar levels and sweetener levels and viscosity levels. And a full 10 years later, after playing around with what they deemed from the Pepsi challenge was changes to consumer taste habits, they created New Coke. The people hated it. New Coke is one of the biggest marketing failures in Coca-Cola's history. And when they went out and asked people why they hated New Coke, they got a lot of very surprising answers. First off, most people right off the bat said New Coke was too sweet. And that's coming from a taste test. They created a product that was intentionally sweeter. Coke advocates though also felt betrayed. They said, look, I've loved Coca-Cola my entire life and you guys changed the formula. And the biggest thing is most people said they still preferred Coke. In fact, they always preferred Coke. And I wanna dive into that. What do you mean they always preferred Coke? We saw in the Pepsi challenge, we saw in actual blind taste tests of small amounts that people prefer Pepsi. So how is it that so many customers saying they actually prefer Coke? Well, the reason is the data was flawed. You know, going back to the Pepsi challenge question, we filled up two small Dixie cups of unlabeled soda and asked people to drink them. The problem with that is consumers don't drink small amounts of soda. 
You know, fun fact, humans don't actually like sweet as much as we think we do. Um, it's one of the reasons that sweet things like desserts and candy are usually smaller than larger meals or other meals or snacks even. We like sweet in smaller quantities, perhaps say in the size of a Dixie cup. But when we actually are asked to drink a whole Pepsi or a whole sweet, uh, sweet concoction, in comparison to the same amount of something that's a little less sweet and a little more salty like Coke, we actually prefer that less sweet option. The power of the Pepsi challenge came from the small Dixie cups. They created a test that made it that people wanted a, a smaller amount. They appreciated the smaller amount. In fact, just from a small sip, most people do in fact prefer Pepsi, but in drinking a whole can, they actually prefer a Coke. Again, this is on the whole, this is on the average of everyone. But again, I wanna stress the point of this question, the power of it is that consumers don't drink small amounts of soda, but instead that Pepsi created a test, they asked a great question about a situation that favored them. So again, by asking a great question, this was the power of what happened from Pepsi's sampling. First off, they changed perception. However flawed the data was, more people believed from that that they liked Pepsi more. They increased buyers, they increased interest. As a result, they increased their market share. They won, they increased exactly what they wanted to achieve. They wanted to sell more Pepsi. But perhaps the biggest marketing victory for Pepsi in this entire process was the development of new Coke. They put their number one competitor on tilt. And the entire process came from asking a great question. So again, there's a lot of different ways to ask a great question. And what Pepsi did here is they interviewed their audience directly. They gave them a scenario where they knew they would win, but they put the power back in the audience and asked them real questions in their face and got real feedback that was literally world changing. Interviews are one of the greatest ways to ask questions. There's focus groups, there's independent interviews, there's many different ways to talk to people, but the entire concept of talking to your customer simply creates more insights. Likewise, there's a lot of other ways to great, ask great questions. There's surveys. Now you've all probably heard of surveys. You've all probably taken a survey. In fact, there's a good chance you've probably taken a survey after take, buying something in exchange for a free Coke or Pepsi afterwards, because a lot of businesses do that to incentivize. But the reason they're doing that is they're talking to a lot of people in the same way that we have interviews, but they're doing it en masse. They're using surveys to talk to many different people and ask them the same questions over and over and use those questions and the power of math to measure how responses and how audiences feel over time about bigger pain point issues that have to do with your marketing. Speaking of measuring data, measuring data and measuring marketing is another great way to ask questions. You know, if you work in any kind of marketing, be it digital, be it out, outdoor, if you have a, some sort of component to measure how it's working and even what's not working, and then you take the time to question why, why is my strategy working so well? Why is this part of the strategy working so well? Or what can make it better? By asking those questions and answering them, you're gonna make your marketing stronger. And that entire process comes from measuring marketing. When it comes to measuring marketing, I'm always talking about data, but, when it talk, but really in marketing, there's so much data out there. There's sales data, customer experience data, social data, internet data, every kind of piece of data you want. And what's great is all of this, when you take the time to look at it, and looking at data can be daunting, I respect that, but it can just be as simple as running it through Excel, taking averages, but once you take the time to look at your data, any marketing data you have, it starts to tell a story. And then when you take the time to ask great questions within that story, you get more insights that help your marketing. Now, those four are, are probably the, the heaviest ways that we can ask great questions. I wanna make sure you have a few more tools here that just uh, get the gear spinning. One of them is observation. You know, if you work in any kind of industry where you have customers, or clients, it's take the time to sit in the waiting room, sit in the storefront, sit in the restaurant, sit in whatever scenario your actual end customers are sitting in and take the time to observe, take notes, see how these people are engaging with your business, what matters to them, what's making them angry, what's working, what's not. And again, just that power of observation is a form of questioning because what you're doing is questioning what's going on so you can inspire yourself to make a better situation at the end. And then if you're brave enough, go up and talk to some of those people. Or better yet, if you have just a, a minimal amount of clients, pick up the phone and go and call those people and talk to them and ask, what matters to you when it, does, when it comes to doing business with me? What's great about doing business with me? What could make it better? And as layman's and as simple as that is, just taking the time to ask questions, literally on the phone asking questions of your best and worst customers, the feedback you get 
helps you create better marketing. So like I said, we're talking about asking great questions. And by doing that, you'll learn everything you need for better marketing. And you'll also learn how to ask even better questions. Now, when I say you'll learn everything you need, asking great questions tells you about your audience's motivations, your pain, their pain points, what goals they have, what do they believe? What do they believe about your business and their in your vertical? What do they believe about your competitors? What inspires them? What inspires them to want to move forward down a marketing story to such a way that they see you as a solution? And what insights can you glean from that that you can then turn around and put back into your marketing? Now, all of that information, when you take the time to, to absorb it, that leads us back to this asking even better questions component. And when you ask a better question, like our Pepsi challenge question, when you ask a great question in marketing, that's how you inspire better creative outcomes. Now, I'll give you a great example of a better question that was asked in the real world. How do you turn everyone into an athlete? Now, this seems like a curious marketing question, but this is a real question that Nike posed to Whedon and Kennedy in 1987. If you guys don't know Whedon and Kennedy, they're a pretty big ad agency. They're, uh, they have a presence all over the world. They're based in New York. Excuse me. And just recently, they actually put out the, uh, the Mario Lopez advertising for uh, KFC. Thanks, Shahab. Sorry, I got some comments in the chat, too. I appreciate everyone. Um, so, again, this question was posed to Whedon and Kennedy by Nike in 1987. How do you turn everyone into an athlete? Now, let's look at Nike in 1987. In... In the late 80s and the mid 80s, Nike made products for athletes and they were known for this. If you put on Nike products and you were an athlete, you were going to be better at your sport or craft. But Nike now wanted to talk to these people who were not athletes and they wanted to figure out how do we get them thinking this way that they need athletic products like better shoes and better, uh, uh, literally Nike products. And so to answer that question, Whedon and Kennedy went out and talked to people. Now, again, they want to tell a story, so they went and answered the main story questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. They talked to hundreds of people through focus group and survey, and they asked people, who is an athlete? Who do you, as a customer, believe an athlete really is? Why would you ever want to be an athlete? What does that mean to you? Um, what do you think of athletes in general? Where are you when you think about being athletic? How are you like an athlete now, and when do you think most about being athletic in the future? They took the time to answer all these questions through a lot, a lot of interviews, a lot of market research. And what they found from this is something really interesting. In fact, the definition of not athletes over here and athletes on the right, that was wrong. What they really found is just about everyone fit into some form of athletic component. You have some people who run and exercise every, every single day. You have people who are sports enthusiasts who just play golf and do yoga sometimes. And you even had people who just wanted to get on the treadmill and lose some weight. And every single one of those people considered themselves in some form, a form of athlete. So Whedon and Kennedy went and they redefined these definitions. So instead, we have not athletes and athletes. We had amateur athletes on the left and professional athletes on the right. And in the middle, what we have is everyone. And everyone is an athlete in some format. And what they also found is everyone almost wanted to do more. The person who wants to lose weight wants to become a little bit more active. The person active wants to be a lot stronger. The stronger people want to become professional athletes. Every single person within this athletic spectrum that encompassed every single customer out there had a desire to do more within the world of what it means to be an athlete. And what they needed, they found, the major pain point that Whedon and Kennedy found from their research is that every single one of these individuals just needed to believe that they could actually do it. Now, this is where it comes back. They've answered a great question. And when you take that time to answer that question, fuel it with the power of creativity and work with copywriters and, and uh, marketing team members and creatives, what you come up with is one of the greatest ad campaigns that's ever been around. Just do it. Now, you've probably heard of Just Do It. Um, Just Do It is, to this day, one of the most successful campaigns in history. It put Nike even further onto the map than ever before. But the power of Just Do It is that it summarizes exactly the pain point that Whedon and Kennedy found by asking questions. As Dan Whedon said, I was trying to write something that would tie it up so it could speak to women who had just started walking to get in shape all the way up to people who are world-class athletes. They took the time to ask these questions. They took the time to answer them. And then they took that the time to take those answers and inspire themselves into one great tagline in marketing campaign. 
which brings us back to the title of today's presentation, The Creative Catalyst. What do I mean by a creative catalyst? I'm literally talking about the thing that inspires creativity, the thing that makes your marketing pop, that gives your brainstorm, your team, everything, the pieces you need to come up with a better idea. And the solution to that the thing that I want to point out is answering questions. It's not just about answering or asking questions, but actually coming up with great answers. And in fact, I like to say it's in fact about answering with ideas. So what do I mean by answering with ideas? Well, let's talk about some stuff you've probably heard of before. If you work in marketing, you've probably heard of a creative brief. If you haven't before, a creative brief is a single page, sometimes two pages document that summarizes everything a creative team needs to know to create something creative. Maybe it's the bones of what needs to be written for a copywriter, or it's the major pain points that need to be addressed in an ad. Whatever it is, a creative brief summarizes what needs to go into the creative process. You've probably heard of segmentation. Segmentation is the notion, excuse me, that your audience is not just one person, but several different people with different pain points and need states. Personas. Personas I always like to think of as our creative briefs for these segments here. A persona is a written document that tells the story of one of these individuals. Um, if you were to think of this person as an intergalactic farmer who's seeking adventure, this would be about Luke Skywalker. It's about tying those together and putting a person behind it. And then we talked about this briefly, but strategy. A marketing strategy isn't just trying out ideas and seeing what works. It's about putting specific tactics into place. Um, it's about doing content marketing to attract interest. It's about creating PR campaigns to maintain interest. And it's about co creating call to action advertising campaigns that draw them further down a funnel. That's a strategy. So all of those things are answers that inspire ideas. But I want you to think about them on one more level. What if we fuel all these with the answers to actual questions? What if we take the time to conduct secondary research, which is just looking across the internet and other sources to see what information is out there about a market and industry and put all that into our creative brief? You know, we're doing segmentation where we're figuring out how many audiences we have and what sizes they are and what matters to them. Take the time to conduct a survey. If you talk to about three or 400 people through a survey, three or 400 of your customers, and then take the time to divide that survey data up by how people are thinking and feeling or how much they're spending or many different categories, that's how you're gonna get the most in-depth segmentation possible. You know, I have focus groups here, but really I'm talking about interviews, taking the time to talk to your audience, to communicate one-on-one -on -one with many different individuals who really are the person you wanna to talk to, and then taking everything you learn from that and using that to write your persona, that to write your character story, that's how you're gonna create the most in-depth character story. And then I talked briefly about data. Again, marketing in, right now has so much data out there, everything from digital to social, to sales data, to CX data. And if you take the time to look at that and figure out the story that's hidden within that data, that's how you're gonna figure out which pieces need to go where within your marketing strategy. And so you take that, you take the time to answer great questions and you create the best creative brief for segmentation or many other different things possible and you bring your whole team together. And this is probably the most important part of answering with ideas and creating better marketing. You bring all the minds together, all the folks who are involved in your marketing and you look over the information and you guys conduct the most kick-ass brainstorm you've ever had. And the reason it's the most kick-ass ever is because every insight you're all kicking ideas off of and bouncing off of are based on real factual insights. And that is the creative catalyst. It's a process that starts with asking great questions, answering with ideas, and ultimately creating markets. Now, that's really gonna wrap up the bulk of my presentation. Again, that really focuses on what I wanna talk about today. But speaking of asking questions, again, I'm a huge fan of asking questions in the world of marketing. And then just to recap, uh, I work as a market researcher specifically with ad agencies. That's the bulk of my clients. Vicariously though, I work with their clients to help them do better marketing. So I'm working with agencies, I'm working with clients. And around Q4 of last year, I started to ask myself the question, are these two audiences thinking about marketing the same? And obviously you can, you can tell if they aren't, there's some uh, curiosities there that we should probably address. So wanting to know if these two audiences are thinking about marketing the same, I asked. Uh, in Q4 of 2020, I conducted a nationwide survey of a few hundred agencies and clients, talked to all of them about how they're thinking about marketing, how they're measuring marketing in 2021. And I actually published that last week into a new research report that 
that I want to make sure everyone on this call has a copy of. So I'm guessing everyone's on their computer right now, which is perfect. If you want to grab your phone, open up the camera, and point it right at this screen, uh, you will get a link, and you can download this report for free. It's totally free. It's always free, but I want to, again, make sure everyone on this call has a copy. Now, if you don't believe in QR codes like all the hippies are using these days, I totally understand. You can also go to suresearch.com slash 2021 marketing goals and get the same thing right there. I think everyone's had a chance. If not, I'll move on. I'll, I'll send that link back. But just to kind of close out, I want to leave you with two great quotes from one of my favorite people in history, Albert Einstein. Uh, first off, creativity is intelligence having fun. I love this quote because what it says is the more information we have, the more intelligence we have, that's the more dots we have in our minds that we're able to connect and be creative with to come up with better ideas. But the other thing that Einstein said is that the important thing is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. And when you think of those two components together, he understands that we never need to stop questioning. We never need to stop being curious because the more curious we are, the more information we gather, and that gives us back this intelligence component, which creates better marketing. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Matt Seltzer with S2 Research, uh, the market research partner for marketers. I've got my contact information down there if anyone would ever like to get a hold of me. But are there, are there any questions at all? Bravo. 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 This is amazing. Yeah. That was really that good. That was great, Matt. Seriously. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop the share here. I have questions too. Yeah. So if, if you don't mind stepping into the weeds on the, on the Coke story. Um, yeah. So I'm actually old enough to have lived through it, but <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I don't know the, the kind of details you've, you've probably studied it or, you know, read articles on it. So I was say that was the summarized. Yeah. Yeah. When, when, I'd like you to hear your thoughts on this. Just when, when Coke changed their flavor, you know, I didn't have an idea. It was, seems to be so far removed from the Pepsi taste test, which I remember also, mm -hmm. but I think you kind of made this point in one kind of way. It was so far removed that they were actually responding to Pepsi. But when they changed the flavor, I feel like a lot of people felt like they were losing something that had been there all the time, like like right. an like an icon brand, and that was almost part of the reaction. So, it, am I right? Did that show up in the research? Like, tell so us. That was almost bigger than the distaste for the flavor. Um, I, you know, there's a conversation happening right now, and if anyone sees me on Facebook, I've been part of it too. Um, Taco Bell just recently changed their menu. They got rid of the Mexican pizza, and People feel betrayed. Now, this is a, a food item. And same thing here with Coke. It, we're not talking about a flavor just. We're talking about something that every time someone talks about the Mexican pizza, they tell me, well, I grew up with it. I ate it forever. It's a component of who we are. However minute, we do relate to brands that at that level, especially iconic brands. I mean, Coke, you, you say Coke. Coke has a very, I mean, Coke could theoretically mean cocaine. And no one thinks that. We think, oh, you mean Coca-Cola? Of course you mean Coke. That's huge that that level of connection between a brand exists. And at that point, your brand is fragile. You change anything, it's like changing a friendship. And people do feel that way and you it reverberates. So when they went back, Mm -hmm. which I also lived through, but this is what I don't know. What I, I want to know. Did, did the ultimate effect actually end up being positive? Like when they brought back the, the original flavor. Yep. So there's a, a lot of theories in the world of marketing that new Coke was actually uh, a ploy that they made it intentionally that people would hate it. So people would love Coca-Cola classic, which came out two months later um, more and Coca-Cola classic outperformed Coke in sales. So I've never heard definitively if that was the strategy. I have heard definitively that new Coke was developed over 10 years, and it did take 10 years specifically to create a product that tasted more like Pepsi. But, and this is the part I've always wanted to know, and I think it's kept behind closed doors, there's a chance in that development they realized people were going to hate new Coke, and that's why Coca-Cola Classic had a brand rolled out in two months. 
that's giving them a lot of credit, isn't it? God, if someone could think through that far, though, I would say strategy. I mean, I've seen chess players who could think 10 moves ahead. There's a chance they were thinking that way. So I, I would love to hear that definitively. Um, ultimately, though, you're right. It had a positive outcome for them over the course of the life. That said, and there's two ways to look at positive outcomes. Coke has done nothing but grow since then, and Coca-Cola Classic helped them with that. But Pepsi has never stopped growing since the Pepsi challenge was introduced. So is it about their market share or is it about their competitors' market share? That comes back to what are you measuring? Yeah. I have That's more. one of my favorite stories. <laughs> I, I, don't, if, I don't want to step on anybody else. I have more, but just let me know. No, go ahead. Go for it, Pete. Okay, so I think everyone can relate to this one. So the just do it slogan uh, I think we all have in one way or another have, have conversations with our clients where we're trying to make their advertising about their customers. Mm -hmm. And the, what you just spelled out about that slogan says very clearly why the just do it slogan isn't even about Nike or it's about the products. It's actually about the customer's dreams and desires and fears. Yeah. And I think a lot of us who sell advertising in one way, shape, or form are always trying to get clients to think that way. And sometimes it's tough. Yep. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that more. Uh, you know, and frankly, I know, I know the Just Do It campaign as long as it's been around, but I, I learned more about it today than I, I realized. And it's, it's been staring at me, you know, in my face for however many years. Well, a lot of those great campaigns are like that, but um so two points I'll make to that. Uh, first off, one of the things that comes to the power of Just Do It is it's copywriting. I mean, it's three syllables, which is huge. And I've heard a lot of different writers say there's super power in less is more. Um, there's a great ad campaign that actually didn't get picked up on the show, The Pitch, a long time ago, um, talking about fueling energy by recycling more. And they said, what can, what can fuel the world? And the answer was trash can. And that one to me is one of the most clever ones because it's so concise, but that's always stuck with me that there's something powerful and concise um, in, in copywriting. That said, and I, I answered that from a tangent, what I would tell clients and what I'll, I'll always tell everyone about marketing um, kind of comes back to that buyer persona mentality. Now buyer personas are, I, I've heard the word cheesy about them. And honestly, I'll be the first to describe them as cheesy, except for the fact that they work. They align people on thinking. And the thing about buyer personas is they're designed to spell out thinking, audience thinking. How is the person thinking? And not just thinking about the world, but you know, I mentioned every product and every business is designed to solve a problem. Well, your customer may not even know they have a problem when you start talking to them. So what does that conversation look like? And then when they do realize they have a problem, they may not even know you're the solution, or they may not, they may think you're one of many solutions and why are you the best? Personas spell out how people are thinking at each stage. And if you think of your marketing instead as a journey, and we want to tell the right pieces of the story at each stage in the journey, it comes back to, now we're, we're going into messaging. And then messaging goes back to the concise standpoint. I mean, the way I always tell people, if I have two friends and one's an introvert and one's an extreme extrovert, and I want to invite them both over for dinner, I'm going to send them two separate texts. I don't send them a mass text. And that's because I know I'm gonna use different messaging for them. Well, we're doing the exact same thing in marketing, except we're doing this on a much broader scale. I'm not sending two texts. I'm putting out digital ads and I'm doing PR campaigns and I'm creating outdoor ads. And every one of those is going to speak to someone on a different level with a different mentality. It's up to us as marketers to be thinking, well, what is that mentality? Where are they physically in the world when they're in that mentality? And what word should I be saying to them at that point? Did that answer your question? Kind of. I'm, I, you know, we could talk all day about because uh, you're you're really studying the market. You're studying the consumers on behalf of the client, mm -hmm. and we have to sell advertising to the clients, and we have to, we have to uh, be armed with as much as we can, which mm -hmm. you've, you've helped us with today tremendously. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I'll have people say to me, you know, come up with something catchy. And sometimes like the just do it thing, they'll go, that's catchy. 
and I'm, I'm always like, well, it's catchy, but there's, there's more to it than that. There's, there's a lot more to it than that. Oh yeah. Well, you know, my favorite in, and you, you see this a lot in the, the ad world, especially after the Super Bowl, um, is when someone comes up with something that's super catchy and super clever and everyone loves it and no one can remember which brand it was. So then you gotta, you gotta go back to the, you know, just cause it's catchy doesn't mean it's functional. I can tell you a great joke, but that's not gonna sell as to research. So it, it has to tie together, and I might not be able to tell you that good a joke, they're okay. Um, but it, it comes down back to the relevance of it. Um, that said, and I will go back, it, it has much more to do with audience mindset than anything else. And that's the thing that I always try to sell a client or a customer on is the thinking of, we're not just coming up with something catchy, we're coming up with something that moves people. And that really is, you know, the di- what, what, what uh, I can't even think the name of the book now, Good to Great. You know, the difference between Good to Great is that As 10%. Well said. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that 10% really is the difference between just a great ad and a functional great ad. I have one more. Yeah. Okay. So I spent a big chunk of the, of the lockdown this year working really hard on my PowerPoint skills. And uh, I thought I was pretty good. And that that came to a screeching halt today. <laughs> Gee, so, no, like, well, so what, what, what have you, what have you, have you just worked hard at it? Or I mean, you had a lot of really cool stuff. Can you share how, if any of us wanted to improve on our PowerPoint and Marissa will stop laughing like anytime now, please. I love you so much, Pete. Oh my gosh, it's too good. <laughs> just sit there. Could, could you guys just see the green envy just oozing? <laughs> I was just like, look at this. Okay. And, no, really, but seriously, I, you know. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge PowerPoint geek. I do way more in PowerPoint than probably anyone should ever do in PowerPoint. I, I make internet videos on PowerPoint. Um, but I, I say that, so I just spend a lot of time in it. But I have a friend, um, uh, and actually a few people on this call have worked with him, uh, Tyler Hannibal. Um, I worked with him years and years ago and he at an agency and he was the, the deck guy. He would make our decks. Um, but I had a presentation like the next day and I'm building the deck and he says to me, no, look, here's how we're going to do it. I want you to record yourself on audio giving the presentation. Don't even have a deck, just talk. And then I gave him the audio file and he made a deck that complemented that. And ever since then, that's been my my approach still. I don't always record myself, but I know what I'm going to say. Um, I will say my PowerPoint decks do not hold up on their own. And that's the difference. They require a speaker with them. But it's, I know what I'm going to say. I go through that. And then I want to make as much animation. I like animation. Uh, to, to help illustrate that story. Um, that said, and I didn't use it in this at all, there's a great software called Powtoon as well. And if I really want to animate something, it's like a super simple software. I'll make a 20 second video that illustrates a point, export it, and throw it right into the PowerPoint. But I can talk PowerPoint all day. It was good. Good job, Thank you. Great presentation. Yeah. It was so great. Thank you. Well, seriously, everyone, this was awesome. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I don't know. We've got a great marketing community in Las Vegas. So uh, 2021, right?